if the people just coming in could uh, take a seat and then we'll begin. We're running a little late as we've had to move venues. But I'm very pleased, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, to welcome you all to this evening's Lionel Robbins Memorial Lecture, the first of three this week to be delivered by Professor Philippe Aguillon from Harvard University. Philippe is now Robert C. Wagner Professor in Harvard's Economics Department and is perhaps best known to many here this evening for his pioneering work on new growth theory. Indeed, that is the theme of this year's Robbins Lectures, Designing Policies for Growth. Together with his longtime co-author, Peter Howitt, Philippe Aguillon was instrumental in developing today's modern version of Schumpeterian growth theory. That collaboration resulted in the magisterial endogenous growth theory, a 700-page book that some in our profession mischievously call the longest econometrica article on record. Today, Philippe's newest book, The Economics of Growth, again with Peter Howitt, is prominently on display in the Economist bookstore, just several hundred yards from here. Now, Philippe's development of the Schumpeterian insight of creative destruction did not end at just explaining aggregate growth outcomes. In fact, like the rapid fire punches in a championship pugilistic bout, Philippe's papers, regularly hitting the top journal pages, have pushed that kernel of an idea and delivered keen insights on a range of economic phenomena, on the relation between growth, competition, and market structure, on business cycles, on the distribution of incomes across people in society, on organizational change, on the economics of innovation and research and development, among many other areas of economic study. But also, all before, during, and after this huge corpus of work, Philippe has continued to push the frontiers of scientific knowledge in other areas. The theory of contracts is another area where Philippe's contributions have been central. Indeed, very early on, while still a PhD student, Philippe's contributions in the theory of incomplete contracts applied to finance had already begun to generate gales of creative destruction among the very top researchers in the profession. So that even now at Harvard, Philippe teaches macroeconomics in the fall and contract theory in the spring, applying his research insights in each of these very large areas equally in the process of teaching students. On a personal note, I have long had occasion to observe Philippe at work. First, when we were both graduate students at Harvard, then assistant professors together in the economics department at MIT, and then again when we both moved to this side of the Atlantic before Philippe decided to move with his family back to Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm especially pleased and honored that the Robbins family Richard Laird, the Center for Economic Performance, and the LSE more generally, have been able to get Philippe back here this week to deliver the 2008-2009 Lionel Robbins Lectures. Seeing Philippe at work is a sight to observe. He gets excited, he jumps up and down, and his words trip over one another at 200 miles an hour to convey his insights to you. With this history of personal and professional interaction, I can assuredly say that this evening's lecture promises to be the kind of intellectual treat that not just I, but that all of us now in the profession have come to expect from Philippe. The lecture will be a wide-ranging tour de force connecting with, among many other things, policy reform in France, higher education, and the roles played by science and technology in economic growth and performance. Now, we've agreed that Philippe will speak for approximately 40 minutes, after which we will have a question and answer session, 
For those of you who, are, who have burning questions to answer still, if at the end of that time we could relegate that to the remaining two evenings for which Philippe will continue to educate and entertain us. Because at the end of this evening, there will be a drinks reception in the senior common room on the fifth floor of the old building, for which all of us, I hope we, Philippe and I will be able to speak to more of you there. Without further ado, Philippe Aguillon. Thanks, uh, Lenny, for these uh, very kind words. And uh, so we've, uh, in fact, uh, Danny, thank a lot uh, of my thinking on growth has been spurred by work that, you, uh, that you've done. And I think we've been uh, also along uh, parallel uh, questions, I think. So I think there have been cross-fertilization uh, between you and me and, and uh, Peter along all these years. Um, so it's a great honor to be here. It's a bit intimidating. So <coughs> Was a, um, so a way to move on. To <coughs> so, um, so in fact, uh, so the, as of, uh, Danny started to, to, to say, so we, we tried to build a framework uh, um, with Peter Howitt, uh, based trying to formalize some insights of Schumpeter uh, and have a model of growth based on the idea of creative destruction and the idea of profit motivated growth. Uh, in order to have a tool to think about growth policy. In fact, you know, when, you when I was taught growth, well, you would study the solo model, which is very elegant. You might see the Harold Domar model. But then you would see, well, what about policy? What can you do about growth? And it looked that you could do nothing about growth because uh, long-run growth would come from God and God would be called technical progress, but there is not so much. You didn't know, okay, so what, uh, what is this object? And, and, uh, and then you would move on to talk about uh, macro policy, fiscal, and, and, and monetary policy. But then you, will not, you would not talk about growth anymore. It's like a dichotomic uh, way of teaching macro. And, and, uh, and you say, but well, no, but, growth sh but, but on the other hand, uh, we advise development economies or even ourselves how to, how to grow faster. So, so how come books don't have anything to say about growth policy? So the idea was really to get a tool to be able to talk about growth policy making. And I think now the idea that growth is an area of policy is becoming so important that now uh, here in, uh, at the London School of Economics, you, have probably the, you will have the best uh, center worldwide, I think, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to think about growth policy making with the countries where you operate. And, and I think that will be, uh, that will be a, great, uh, a great endeavor. And, and uh, so it's great to, give, uh, to talk about growth here. I mean, it's just, uh, what, what, what else, what best could you hope? I mean, that uh, you know, from a field that used to be very boring uh, 20 years ago, now it's a field that excites everybody. And that, you know, the uh, British government, even in a period of uh, hardship, is re you know, ready to put so much money into it. So that's, I mean, it's quite, uh, and they could have reacted like, or Dean in Harvard say, no, in fact, uh, no more, no, and they, they keep uh, believing in... Uh, anyway, so if you say 40 minutes, uh, that, that has not counted what I said so far. <laughs> 40, 40 minutes of, as of here. Okay. So, uh, so in fact, uh, so the kind of things that... So I, we started so developing a growth model and then talking about growth policy, but then we got involved a bit into thinking about growth policy making in Europe and France, because there was a bit this view that Europe and France in particular, had institutions or policies that were very much uh, adapted, suited to the needs of economies, which I said would be catching up, catching up economies, like we were doing after World War II. And we had, you know, uh, uh, school system emphasizing primary, secondary education, which is very good when you want to catch up. Uh, uh, financial system emphasizing bank finance, large firms, limited competition, very much infant industry way of thinking, Colbertism, we say in French, you know, kind of industrial policy, top down. That was very much the way of thinking. And then people realized that those guys were not so good when, you, when innovation becomes the engine of growth. And when we had exhausted the power of uh, catching up, uh, then you need to move to other type of institutions to reorganize labor markets, product markets, to in fact be able to become a truly innovative economy. So a number of countries, or in Europe as a whole, has, uh, became aware that you had to undergo a transition in Western Europe. You see, after the transition in Eastern Europe, you had to start a transition in Western Europe. And so we worked on something called the Sapir Report, which was a report written for Prodi, uh, um, uh, I remember we presented to Prodi. Prodi was sleeping most of the time, but he woke up at the right moment 
And I thank God he has political uh, skills because it was something which was politically delicate and he woke up then. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, and then we did the Sapir report and then we, uh, more recently we, I did, I've done, been doing some advising for the French, for the French government. So the French government with uh, our, you know, very animated, uh, I, can't, I can't go, I can't emulate him, it's impossible, uh, 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 Nicolas Sarkozy, is engaging uh, in, in supposedly growth enhancing reforms. Uh, uh, and, uh, and in fact, when you look at his uh, growth agenda, it's, it's supposed to take into account ideas that uh, me and my colleagues have put forward for a number of years. In fact, uh, he took on board a, a report that I wrote for the uh, Prime Minister, even though I, support, I did not support him during the campaign, I must say that shows, uh, uh, that shows uh, you know, open-mindedness, I would say, but uh, <laughs> on his part. But, uh, and then he asked Mr. Attali to write a report also, uh, which used the previous report, but was very much pushing the same uh, ideas that we, had, uh, that we had done. Now, I, what I want to do here is to reflect on my own mixed feelings vis-a-vis -vis the reform process engaged in France, but I will go beyond that, uh, even though France is finally getting out of years of no reform. So now I realize that you are in fact not using the, because I, I've, I've done, a, a, I read, wrote more on the slides, but that's not the slides here. And I said, because the years of no reform, Sarkozy had a very gentle way of describing Chirac. He calls Chirac le roi fainéant. Roi fainéant means uh, lazy king, no? The lazy king, voilà. That came a week ago. Um, and so he said, now finally we are getting out of no reform. So now I suppose you want to, uh, to talk about growth policy making. What can you do? Well, you can look at what we call the Washington Consensus. The Washington Consensus would tell you, well, you know, stabilize your economy, privatize, and liberalize your market. So, to some extent, you know, it's not completely crazy. I mean, it's true that you want a stable, reasonably stable macroeconomy. We'll come back to that tomorrow. Uh, 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 it's true that you don't want all firms to be state-owned, even though you may want to nationalize banks in bad times, but uh, that's another thing we want to enter into. <laughs> Uh, and it's true that liberalizing product and labor markets is something that has been uh, shown as being conducive to uh, innovative activity. So there is, it's not that the Washington consensus is, is, is crazy in itself. Uh, 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 then you have the Hosman Rodri growth diagnostic approach where they say, well, in fact, you should look into the condition. You cannot have the same recipes for everywhere. You should adapt to the local conditions. Now, the way they do it, you could, I don't want to enter into that because uh, we had big debates in South Africa on the question. I don't want to, uh, you may agree or disagree with the way they do it, but at least the fact that they say, look, Asia grew fast without doing exactly what the Washington consensus say uh, is, uh, uh, you know, something interesting to take into account. And then you have a paper by Easterly, several papers by William Easterly, and Easterly is very good at writing papers that you may not agree with, but are always very provocative. So, for example, you wrote a paper uh, which was published in the Handbook of Economic Growth that uh, I co-edited with uh, Steve Dioloff in 2005, where he says, well, when you make a horse race between policy and institutions, like, you know, expro uh, you know property right protection, for example, institution win, and then policy doesn't matter. So if you, you do a cross-country panel regressions and... You, you do a horse race, you try to see which of policy, like, you know, uh, uh, he had competition, black market premium, inflation, he looked at some kind of policies, not all, a few policies, and you do a horse race between them and expropriation risk. Essentially, when you have countries, you know, it, it seems that expropriation risk is what matters most. So the, his view is to say, once you get the basic institutions right, you don't need to worry so much about policy making. So that's a kind of very negative view on policy. He said, in fact, you know, try to make sure you have contractual enforcement, try to make sure that things, uh, the, that you don't have, uh, you know, Mugabe is there, and then, you know, essentially, uh, uh, you know, essentially, you don't have to worry about the detail of policy because, you know, that doesn't matter so much, okay? So, uh, uh, and of course, I will try to argue that this view is not right. Is, uh, is, um, okay, so that I'll try to go again. Then you had more recently uh, a very intelligent report uh, headed by Mike Spence. Um, and uh, Mike Spence is most known for his work on uh, signaling. I'm sure you've, you've uh, studied. He's the one who introduced signaling models. And also he's done you know, pioneering work in, industrial organization, in theory of I.O. 
But he had not done much work on growth at that time, but he, 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 he conducted a report which is, I think, very intelligent. He mixed uh, academics and policy makers, and they thought about the problem very, in a very pragmatic way. And so the, the, they didn't come, back, come up with kind of revolutionary conclusions. You know, they would say education is important, infrastructure is important, political stability, competitive pressure, whatever. But they uh, recommended pragmatism, and they tried to see, you know, different types of countries need different things, and that's how we should think about the problem. They have what we call the pasta story. So let me try to retranslate into English uh, the Spanish report, which I got in French here. It's a bit uh, counterproductive. I should have the English version. There exist several recipes for pasta. I'm translating from French. <laughs> the list of ingredients and the time of cooking... Uh, are different in all cases. You don't cook rigatonis like you cook uh, spaghettis, okay? But so, you, uh, of course, you have to adapt to rigatonis, to spaghettis, and all that. But of course, if you forget the salt, or if you uh, keep the, uh, the, 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 the pasta in water too long, for sure you will have very bad food, okay? So that's the idea. I'd say growth theory is like pasta making. Huh? That's a bit the, the gist of the report. I think you should still read the report because it goes beyond what I just said. <laughs> Uh, uh, my, own take, my own take on this is uh, the way I've been going, and so I'm advertising uh, the book, uh, which is uh, uh, now at the Economics Bookshop, <laughs> uh, is, that, uh, is that one should use new growth theories, so I don't say by whom, but uh, to suggest interactions between policies and technological or institutional variables. So my take is to say it's wrong to say I do a horse race between policy and institution. In fact, you should interact the two. Depending on the, on the slow-moving institutions you have in a country, or depending upon the stage of technological development in a country, you would not implement the same type of policies to grow. So you have to interact them. Instead of doing a horse race between them like this study does, you should interact the two, the two types of variables. And uh, that's one thing. And then, of course, you should use the growth regressions. Uh, you should, then you should uh, resort to growth regressions to test the interaction effects that uh, you know, theory can predict and maybe and change your models and thereby suggest appropriate growth policy. And uh, of course you can have cross-country regression, but you, you try to go to a more micro, go cross-region, uh, cross-firm, cross-industry, and uh, try to do better econometrics this way. Okay, I don't want to bother you too much with introduction, but uh, uh, so, uh, so the French, what they did for the French Prime Minister, we said, you know, uh, we, we tried to do a kind of cross-country panel regression, uh, where you would regress growth on various kind of policies. So what was very interesting is if you first put R&D and ITC, both come very significantly. But then when you introduce, that's what I call the layers of growth policy. But then when you introduce policies like product market competition, labor market flexibility, and higher education, then the R&D and the ITC variable becomes much less significant because what's important is what makes R&D happen, what makes ITC happen. And what makes them happen is the layer, on the, the layer underneath which is the policy making. You want to have, if people cannot you know, enter markets easily, if people cannot hire and fire easily, or if, if they cannot rely on higher education investment, you, you, uh, you know, R&D policy will not be very effective, and, and not much ITC will happen. So you, you go from the pure knowledge, the Lisbon layer, to a kind of more structural layer, which is the policies, which will enable the first layer to happen. Because otherwise, if you do like just people, the Lisbon agenda, just say R&D and skills, nothing happens. In fact, you have to go into the policy underneath. So that's what we push with the Sarkozy. And they say now they want to. And to some extent, they try to do it. So that's a regression showing that EPL, it means labor market regulation. And so when you say higher tertiary, it means that you are a country whose productivity is very close to the top productivity. So if you are a country with productivity very close to US productivity, to have labor market regulation is very bad for growth. It's less of a problem if you are a country which is less advanced. You see, so that gives you the idea that, you know, for European countries, when we were, uh, after World War II, we were far from the U.S. productivity. It was okay to have labor market regulations more, but when you get become more developed and you want to innovate more, it's more important to have less EPL, that means more market liberalization. So that's the kind of regression you can do. And, uh, and then you, can, you use these regressions, and then you say, well, where is France compared to other countries? So, for example, you can see that uh, on, uh, uh, spending on higher education, which is the third uh, row, uh, France spends much less than uh, uh, you know, other uh, the, uh, type of countries on, uh, do on, on higher education. 
And also, we have, uh, um, when you look at the, marché, the, the, the last three rows, and for your French, at least you, I don't know if you learn much economics with me today, but you learn some French. Marché des biens means good market, uh, and then uh, the labor market and, and the interaction. And so it means that you make the product of the two. And what's interesting is that on good market and uh, labor market, we are more regulated than uh, other uh, uh, group of countries, more regulated than uh, Anglo-Saxon countries and Scandinavian and also Renan. Renan is really Belgium, uh, 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 Germany, uh, Luxembourg and everything. So we need, there is room for improvement, for increasing our what we call growth potential. So the France, they realize they can increase growth potential by investing more in higher education and by liberalizing product and labor market. But there is a, a say that says, you know, that the devil is in the details. And that's where I start having problem with Sarkozy a little bit. So what I will do to today is that I, I want to go to, into things that uh, require, uh, uh, you know, to go more into detail. So first, I want to argue that, you know, it's good to say I want to invest more in higher education, but you need to have a good understanding of how to organize and fund higher education and research. That's what we'll be talking about today. Then uh, you want to have a better understanding of the interplay between macroeconomic policy and growth. For example, should you have counter-cyclical fiscal policy or not when you are in a recession like now? Is it important not just for the short run or for long run growth to just have a big stimulus or very shy stimulus like Sarkozy is having? Or should you go much more bold like Gordon Brown or Obama are doing? That's very important to know, not just for the short run but for the long run. And I will argue that for the long run growth, it's important to be very much counter-cyclical, okay? So that will be the second part, which will be the tomorrow I do, uh, today is this, tomorrow is this and this. A third thing is that we don't have a good framework yet to think about environment and sustainable growth. All models of growth and sustainable development use exogenous growth. None of them uses the fact that, you know, when you tax a sector, it induces innovation in other sectors than the sector you tax. And uh, you have to, what happens when you take this idea on board? Okay, when you say that you induce technology, clean innovations by taxing dirty inputs. And so that we talk about environment and sustainable growth tomorrow. And then the last thing which I think uh, 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 Sarkozy really didn't understand, that that was my only discussion with him, because with this Atali group we met with Sarkozy. And I told Sarkozy, look, you know, I, look, I mean, I don't know, it's a bit always intimidating to talk to a uh, president. And he said, there is something I think that you may, may want to reconsider a bit is that you are very happy that you have weak unions. But I think if you want to have uh, 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 lasting structural reforms, lasting deregulation of product and labor markets, you need to increase trust in the French uh, uh, labor market. For example, there is huge distrust in France between employers and employees. You have huge distrust between citizens and, and the state. And that's not good, and, and we will show that will be the third lecture, that whenever you have high level of distrust, it's very high, to it's very difficult, sorry, to deregulate when you have low levels of trust. And so the trust, you see, that's the third layer. I told you the first layer is knowledge, the second layer is the reforms, product market, labor market, and the third layer is working on trust, working on culture. If you don't have trust in the labor market, or in, in, in relationship between people, it may be very difficult to uh, uh, to really have uh, lasting structural reforms uh, working in a country. And, 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 uh, and he's done certain steps that, in fact, puts categories one against the other instead of, in fact, investing in trust building. And I think and that's the kind of debate we are having. Of course, I should add to that another one which is missing with the crisis, which is a proper understanding of the link between uh, uh, financial regulations and growth. How should we now... now you see clearly now there's been a big move toward deregulating, but of course some people say, well, should you also completely deregulate finance? No, you, should, you need to put new regulations. But how much should you put without killing the growth process? Uh, up, up to which point you have that financial innovation is uh, complementary to true innovation or, or, or substitutable to true innovation? How should you uh, design a regulation when you know that people will try to do financial innovation to escape them? So there is a whole uh, try to thinking to be done on, uh, you see, uh, a design of new financial regulations in light of long-run growth objectives that you have. And I think that, that, but that I have not been working, uh, I'm just starting this research. That's why we will not be able to talk about it uh, this year. So, uh, outline of the lecture, uh, governance of higher education, growth and fiscal policy over the cycle, environment and technical change, uh, 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 and regulations and culture. So that's the menu. So, um, so uh, three themes will emerge, I hope, from the lectures. 
One C is that instead of doing a horse race between policies and institutions, what's important is the complementarity, the interactions between the two. So in fact, the two interact, and you want to understand how they interact. There are several layers of growth policy, knowledge, uh, uh, policies, and culture. And the, and the one thing which is, I think, interesting uh, uh, is that there is more than one model of growing market economy. I think people now are thinking, what kind of capitalism can we have? We know that huge stock options and huge golden parachutes, we don't want anymore. So there may, maybe not everybody will choose that, by the way. So, so the US is also thinking its own model. And the question is, will, shall we all become Scandinavians? Or, sh or, sh or shall we all see several surviving models? You see, there are models that work and models that won't work. France is not a, a model that was working well before. So clearly France was not a stable equilibrium. Uh, but people had the view that the UK, uh, uh, you know, the Blair time UK, you know, the current UK, and Sweden and Finland are both type of models that are not identical, they are different in various respects, and they all seem to produce long-lasting growth. Not, will all of them survive uh, the, the crisis, or will the crisis in fact lead to a convergence between these models? Or will they lead, you see, to a, a, a different evolution along different paths of these models? I think those are fascinating questions to, to, to think about. Um, oh God, I've not, I've not yet started. No, I've started. <laughs> Part two, 40 minutes now. I'm joking. It's not joke. Okay. Well, look, I, well, the problem is that I have a lot to show. But look, I, we do what we do. Huh? And, and uh, you can stop me. You are fed up with me. And, okay. So uh, I want to talk about governance of higher education. So we want to understand how European universities properly govern and what are the key ingredients to good university performance and good contributions of university to the growth process. We want to, show, we want to feel that we academics are useful and how can we be made more useful? Can we be made useful at all? So, uh, <coughs> so now uh, um, there are various ways of looking at performance of universities. One way is to look in terms of your, the Shanghai ranking. You've heard about the Shanghai ranking. So it's, uh, we will talk about it. It's a kind of uh, strange thing, but it's, uh, it got people in France starting to worry about, uh, because it was a ranking, you see? So that they started, and they were badly ranked, and they started to, whoa, we have to do something. So only for that, it had a lot of merit, even if you can criticize the detail of the ranking. Uh, then uh, also, your, your, uh, performance is important that you know how much universities contribute to economic growth. And I will look at both aspects. So that's the performance side here. And now you want the governance side, and uh, we mean who decides about academic, financial, and research question? Is it the central government that decides, or is it the university that decides, okay? And uh, so now the Shanghai Index, what is the Shanghai Index? The Shanghai Index is, a, is an index that mixes up apples and peers, okay? So you put together how many alumni won Nobel Prizes and field medals? How many faculty winning Nobel Prize and field medals? And then you go into publications, which are, I think, more, you know, how many uh, papers published in Nature and Science, how many, you know, what kind of science citation index uh, you have. And uh, uh, so it's a mixture of citation and, and, Nobel and, and prize winning uh, with various, uh, but if you don't like it, you can take sub-index. You could say, I just want the, the citation part, and you get very much the same result. So that's comforting, is that, in fact, even if the index may sound strange to you, it moves together like other index, like how much you patent, how much you contribute to growth, how much you publish, and that's all. And, and the Shanghai move very much commonotonically. Okay, so that's the... So now here we go. Now what is this picture? This picture uh, shows the following. Uh, uh, you show US at 100, and it's not done by... What you do is the following. So the Shanghai index, if you rank the first 500, you put 500 to the number one university, which I won't tell you which one it is, because you will find it's very bad test. <laughs> then, then, then you, the second one has 499. Then the third one has 499. And then you go down, the 500 has one, and then everybody else has zero, okay? But when you rank the, f the first 100, the number one has 100, the number two has 99, and you go down and down, and the, the 100 has one, and everybody else has zero, okay? Then what you can do is that you look at UK, UK has a, and you look at the 100. So when some universities may have 60, some may have 40, and you do the sum of the ranking and you divide by UK population. And, uh, 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 and you do the same for US, so, uh, uh, and you divide by the US index and you multiply by 100. So that of course was US at 100, which is a normalization. And then you see compared to US, how countries rank. So uh, Massachusetts is not yet a country, but it ranks very well, so we should say Massachusetts, right, you see. 
are very... And so I put in blue the uh, uh, U.S. states, okay? So California also does well. And U.S. average is here, you see, because you also have uh, Alabama, Mississippi, and all that, okay? So, that's <laughs> <laughs> so that brings you down. So, uh, so, but, uh, uh, but now U.S., uh, U.K. is almost as good as U.S., you see? It's doing very, yeah, very well. Uh, EU 25 is a disaster, it's not very good. <laughs> and uh, EU 15 is not good either. I mean, it's barely better than that. And, uh, and then you see, but what's interesting is that uh, Sweden and Switzerland are doing very well, you see. That's very, so UK and US, and the models are different because UK, you have, you know, you, at Denver University you pay tuition. So, um, I know because I pay tuition for my daughter in Edinburgh, but, uh, so I know I can tell you. That. But uh, whereas in Switzerland and Sweden, you don't, okay? And, uh, and also, uh, you have other, uh, you know, respects in which they, uh, they in Sweden, is are purely public universities, and less so in, in UK. So it's a different model, but both seem to be working well. And we try to understand what makes it work well. But France does not do well, and, and Spain and Italy do very poorly, okay? So that's... Uh, well, Spain, well, except in Catalonia would be, of course, <laughs> Catalonia, uh, Catalonia would be here, but uh, I remember from the other, oh, 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 oh. Madrid would be there. Okay, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so. Uh, so, God, let me go. Oh God, I, I got already. So, let me go on, uh, be a bit serious down the lecture so far. Uh, uh, so here we look at the, top at the top ranking. So it's just performance you are looking at. Huh? So you see EU 15, we are almost not there. If you look at the top 50, uh, and you put US at the 100 scale, uh, uh, you see the UK is very well, it's at 72. Uh, Switzerland is already at 97. Uh, uh, and then uh, Netherlands a little bit, and then nobody else is there. And you see even Sweden, and, uh, and, and, and uh, Sweden, you know, is not there for the top 50. Now, if you look at the top 100, then suddenly Sweden comes in. You see, so they are very good for the top uh, 100. Uh, and, of course, Switzerland is even better. And then when you look at the two, two, uh, top 200, then you start having other countries coming in, you see. And uh, uh, even France is starting to wake up a little bit here, to 200. <laughs> and a little bit more top 500. But you see, so typically European universities don't make it to the first tier, but they make it, apart from UK, but they make it to the second tier, you see? Uh, uh, so that's interesting in itself, to see just have a sense where we are. No, whether we, we it's, uh, it's not we, the same for you. Your we is better than our we. Okay, so that's where, that's interesting, I think. Huh? Performance. So now you want to understand how performance leads to Determinants to, well, you know, there are two things. You give money, you, you, if you are very poor, even, you know, you can be autonomous, but with no money, if you cannot turn on the light, nobody will see what you write on the blackboard. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also governance is important. So what we want to go is to a bit more into, into what makes performance. Huh? So here I just do cross-section analysis, and when I say cross-section, it's either cross-country or cross-states. Of course, the econometrics is terrible, but it give, it's suggestive. So very often what you do in growth, some, you start with kind of rough stuff, and at least the econometrics can be suggestive sometimes. Of course, you should, you should be very low-key and not pretend that it explains much, but at least it gives you ideas that you want to pursue and go more into more micro-econometric uh, <coughs> analysis. So first you look at performance and spending per student, and, uh, and you see that in fact, uh, uh, you see that in fact, you see that it's really a clearly positive correlation between spending and performance. Huh? On the vertical axis, I have the, I have my uh, 100 uh, Shanghai index, on my, and on the, on the, on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, I have expenditure per student in thousands of euros. And you see, really, you have a clear uh, positive correlation. Huh? No, there is no miracle in this world. Huh? You have to pay for what you want. So the, the, and in fact, you can see here the spending. You know, for example, uh, uh, US, they spend 3.3% of GDP uh, 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 per, on, 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 on higher education. You see, whereas France, for example, uh, where is France? It's 1.2%, it's much less. And even if I look at the public part of US, it's above France, you see what I mean? Because you could say it's all private money. But in fact, even the public part of US is, is slightly above the, what France spends. So that's an interesting. And per student, you know, in the US, you, you spend 36,500 uh, euros a year on average. 
whereas in France, you know, whereas in EU, you spend uh, four times less, essentially, in uh, EU 25. You know? So that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, what's interesting here is that the UK doesn't spend much. And we'll get back to that. But that's very interesting about the UK system. Is that the UK, on average, doesn't spend much, but they spend well. You see, that's the thing. You learn that you spend well, but well, you could say you could spend more, but uh, uh, at least what you spend, you spend well. It's very interesting that you are very, you are much closer to the EU average than you are to the US average. That's uh, something to keep in mind. Okay, let me go on. And now, be, well, of course, the most interesting is the governance. I'm interested about the governance organization. Hmm? So what we did is to say, well, let's take the, the 500 top universities in the Shanghai ranking and, uh, uh, and look at uh, how many European universities you have there. Well, you have 196 in the top 500. And they are distributed across 14 countries. So, uh, and of course, they, each university has its characteristic. Uh, more older, younger, public, private number of students can be large, can be small, uh, etc. But of course, the thing we were most interested in and uh, uh, to construct our index of autonomy, because what we did is to construct an index of autonomy using what we call factor analysis to aggregate uh, answers to many questions like those into one index. This kind of question, do you set your own curriculum? Do you select your own students? To what degree do you select your own professors? Is that strong on the game? Do you select your own students or you hire from, from outside the university? Uh, are you free to set wages the way you want? Are all professors within the same seniority pay the same wage, or you are free to pay people who publish more? more? Hmm? Uh, uh, what is the share of funding which is core public funding? How much of your funding comes from competitive grants? Uh, what is the composition of the board? You see, you ask all these questions. Alors now, the bad news, alors of course, for, uh, for the US, you have, uh, for the US, you have comparable uh, questions, but uh, uh, for the US, you have, uh, uh, you have data, and the data come from the U.S. come from uh, um, the National Co the Committee on Government and Higher Education. And they have uh, 1950 uh, variables which are updated. And, they, and, uh, and so those are kind of dimensions of autonomy. So the first one you look at for U.S. is what we call university freedom from centralized purchasing. What does it mean? This looks a bit barbarian way of, of talking, but it means, in fact, are you free to purchase, for example, your labs? Are you free to choose what, what, you, what computer you want or what kind of equipment you want or it has all been to, to be purchased by the state and they choose and, uh, uh, or are you free to choose and to buy from private firms, for example? Uh, that seems to be very important. Uh, to which extent uh, your budget is, you have budget independence vis-à-vis -vis the state government? Are you free to fire, hire and set faculty wages? And we compose those again with factor analysis into one autonomy uh, index for public universities. So uh, uh, now the thing for the, for the, the survey on the Europe is that uh, not everybody uh, responded. In fact, the, uh, the response rate of France were very low. So the good country responded a lot, and the bad countries like France or uh, Spain or Italy, uh, much less. So we said, God, we have a selection problem. We should stop there. But we realized that, in fact, the, the performance among those who responded was representative of the performance overall, because performance we knew for all universities. So we said, well, we have a representative sample, so we can keep going. Because in fact, we got answers from a few, just they are lazy. It's not because they are bad, they are ashamed of, of saying. It's because just, it's, uh, you know, they are disorganized maybe, or whatever. But they are representative of the ranking that we had. If we just restricted the ranking between countries to those who responded, it was the same ranking as if we take all the universities uh, uh, of the sample into account. And uh, so what we saw is that, and that is very interesting, because UK there, you see, it's almost at US level. You see, UK is very high. On average, the budget per student in the UK universities, which are in the top 500 and responded, is 24,500 uh, uh, euros a year. So much above the 11,000 a year. So that means that, in fact, the funding in the UK is pretty much concentrated on the, on the good performer. So I guess all these schemes, like research assessment exercise or whatever, contribute to, to channel the money to the guys who perform well in the Shanghai Index. So that's very interesting that the UK, uh, you see, whereas Sweden and all that, they would spread, they would spend much more and give to everybody. UK, in a sense, have a system to not spend that much, but to give to some universities and not others. So that's a kind of interesting feature about the UK that you can see right away here. Uh, and then, of course, you can write them on each uh, budget autonomy. But what's interesting is to link the, to use this to do kind of cross-section regression between the various measures of autonomy and performance. 
So let me just walk you so very quickly through a few figures. Uh, uh, so for example, here I look at correlations, so really here, I look at correlations between university output and autonomy for European countries, okay? So, uh, and what I do in circles is that I give more weight to universities which have more students, which are bigger, okay? And less weight to smaller universities. But you could also do the unweighted and you get very much also positive correlation. What's very interesting is who are the good guys? Well, the good guys, the North, uh, the North East guys, uh, you have Sweden and UK, okay? Those are the good guys, you see? The two models again, huh? The, you have two ways of doing it. <coughs> Huh? You can do, uh, but of course, the, the, well, I don't dare, the, the, not the good guys. Uh, why not France here? France is somewhere hidden there, but uh, that, otherwise, uh, Luis would be angry at me, and I'm not sure that's not, uh, that, uh, that it's not also France should be somewhere here. I think France is so bad at this say, no, but uh, it's not even on the picture. Uh, uh, so, so that's what you do. But now you can do the same type of exercise with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, <coughs> across uh, US states. So across US states, you do the same kind of thing between autonomy and, uh, and Shanghai. And uh, those who are doing very well are Washington, California, Colorado, Wisconsin. And those who are not doing very well are Arkansas, Louisiana, South Carolina. Okay, so again, you have uh, measures that are. So that means that the, the first one, you know, the California, Colorado have high autonomy, uh, high autonomy, high, high uh, performance, and the other guys have low autonomy, low performance. Okay, so that you, what you do here is the 1950 autonomy. This, uh, you, this, uh, it was the previous measure of autonomy constructed in 1950 uh, in, the UK, in the US, and uh, even though the measure was constructed differently, you again find a positive correlation, and you again find the same countries up and down. Northeast and Southwest are the same kind of uh, states in the US that you get, even though the, the measures were computed very differently of autonomy in the 1950 and uh, 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 recently. Uh, now, if you look at uh, uh, university output, the Shanghai, and government control of faculty salary, you see a negative correlation. Universities that have, uh, where, uh, uh, sorry, states in the US where uh, you have more government control of faculty salaries do uh, less well in Shanghai. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, whereas more, those who enjoy more autonomy do better. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this one, this one is uh, uh, government control of students' admission, and uh, there it's back to Europe. And you see that uh, here, uh, whenever you have no government control of students' admission, you do much better than when you have complete government control of students' admission. Uh, this one is uh, university output and share of budget from government done uh, European. And then you see that uh, the, the higher the share of budget from government and control from government, uh, uh, no, say government instead of competitive grants, uh, 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 there you, you, know, you do less well. So if the share of budget directly comes from government, not from other sources, you are more dependent on government and your Shanghai performance goes down. You see? So autonomy is a good thing. And, uh, uh, and there is the interesting thing is the competitive grants. Whenever you have a higher share of budget from competitive grants, you do better. So it's important to have competition. So what comes from that is that there are three ingredients that seem important. It's uh, funding, it's autonomy, and it's competition. You need to have competition among universities. Those three things are important. And I will come back later on to the French reform and say what, why, why the Sarkozy reform was incomplete to my mind. What he tried to do and what he didn't do. Yes, at least. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's for the, the equivalent for the US. And again, we see a positive correlation between university output and dependence on competitive grants. So uh, now here you can look at the various put of the source rates between the various elements. And you see that what's important is that the the, between performance the correlation coefficients are bigger with budget per student, with budget autonomy, with hiring autonomy, and with wage setting autonomy. Those guys for Europe seem to be important. That's for Europe only, this one. Huh? And for Europe, if you try to do a regression of, uh, 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 or, you know, on sh of Shanghai performance on various elements, size is important. When you have a bigger university, you're more likely to have more publications and be more alumni with Nobel Prizes. The age, but also the budget per student, the budget autonomy, and the interesting thing here, and then we will get back to that more in detail now, 
is that there is an interaction between budget and autonomy. If I want to put more money into university, the effect on performance is all the bigger when the university is more autonomous. If I want to give autonomy to university, the effect will be bigger if you get also funding to your university. There is complementarity between the two kinds of measures. Now remember the easterly, uh, the, the complementarity between slow-moving institution and fast-moving. Uh, autonomy is a slow moving, uh, funding is, is supposed to be a faster moving, and the two are complementary, in fact, in the process of performance. Huh? So that's what I want. So now I can say, well, these are regressions. We had this kind of cross section regression. Could you do better? Could you do better econometrics? And what we try to do is to say, well, we could do better, and that's a more general thing on education and growth. So if you're never interested in education and growth, I'm sure you've seen some regressions by, for example, uh, Ben Abib and Spiegel and others have tried to regress uh, growth on uh, education, make you remember why. But the problem with this regression is that they are full of problems. Uh, and when you control for country fixed effect, you lose everything. Uh, instruments are terrible. Uh, you don't know what causality you are capturing, if it's from education to growth or from growth to education. So in fact, the exercise I'm trying to do here, at the same time I'm dealing still with my problem of what are the ingredients to successful policy, I'm trying to also deal with the uh, contentious issues that, uh, you know, uh, was, uh, um, you see, that was affecting all these studies on education and growth that I'm sure you've heard about and which are very problematic. Okay, so uh, why U.S. states? Because U.S. states, you can analyze many cohorts. Well, cohort is, a, you know, every year you have a new cohort, okay? Uh, uh, and the cohort you can follow, for example, people born in 1959, you can follow where they were born and how much was spent in the state where they were born, well, every year, between 1959 and nowadays. So you can follow the spending on each type of education each year in each state in the U.S. Uh, you have 48 states, so that's a lot of data. So you know you can do always better econometrics and you have more observations. And you have uh, 26 cohorts we are considering uh, uh, across 48 states. So you have uh, much more data. So when you control for, for example, state fixed effects, you don't lose significance of uh, coefficients in your regressions. But also the other thing is that you have more credible instruments. So I, well, the idea of the instrument, uh, you see, the, uh, uh, is, is the following. Suppose you regress growth on education and you find a positive correlation. You don't know if you are capturing the causality from how long do I have still? Uh, minus how much? <laughs> oh, five, no, well, no. Uh, <laughs> no, I could say 10, 10, 12. <laughs> 12 and a half, no, 12, 11 and a half. Well, let's do 10 minutes. 10 minutes and Louis can ask any questions. Huh? Yes, 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 exactly, yeah. One. No. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Ten, minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, so because we are going. So you, you have this problem that you find a positive correlation between education and growth. You don't know if you are capturing the fact that education is good for growth or that because you are a faster growing country, the country can afford to spend more on education. And that's been the problem. So usually people say, well, let's control for past spending in education. But those are very weak instruments. They are not satisfactory. So uh, what you can do here in the US, you can use corruption. Now, corruption has many wrong uh, sides to them, but it's very good for econometricians. So corrupt people are yeah, very hot commodities for econometricians. Because in fact, you see what happened is the following. For example, you are interested to know if uh, spending, increasing spending on research education in a given state in the US was good for uh, growth in this US state. Now you see there is a good, uh, you try to look at an exogenous source of increasing spending on higher education in that state, which has nothing to do with growth. Corruption is a perfect one, you see. So, uh, so the, the thing is the follows, is that you know, you have what we call appropriation committees. So appropriation committees is that in fact, you see in, uh, in the Senate or the House of Representatives, you have a committee for research to, that allocates federal funding on research education. Now that they have people, senators, uh, for the Senate, and you have a head of it who is a senator, for example, from Alabama. So uh, here becomes this guy, Lister Hill. And Lister Hill, I made him famous, you know, because I'm famous. So this guy, Democrat from Alabama, you may think he's a nice guy, but Democrat in Alabama in those years doesn't mean you are a nice guy at all. I don't want to go into details. But, uh, and, uh, so the, the guy becomes head of the Appropriation Committee in 65, okay? And here I'm representing in thousands of dollars per capita what goes into cohort concerned by research education on average. So people who go through research to graduate schools, essentially, how much they get more per year, okay? Uh, uh, and you see, and I look at three states, so yes, Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. 
and look at the miracle. Suddenly, the spending in Alabama leapfrogs the spending, and then of course he goes back because this year, Mr. Lister, he stops being head of the appropriation committee. So why does he do that? Because in fact, Mr. Lister Hill is a senator from Alabama. He wants to be reelected in Alabama. He's not being elected by Georgian uh, or Mississippians, okay? So, he, of course, he cannot deliver highways because he can only deliver research. So he said, look, I give you what I can give you. Uh, uh, it's true, maybe, when you need more you know, things that, uh, to your colleges, but that I can't deliver. I can only deliver research education institution. So I just give you what you are. But you see that I'm a nice guy, so you vote for me again. You see what I mean? And that's what uh, happened. And, uh, and, uh, and that's this guy, you see? And that's, uh, that's the instrument we use. So we use as an instrument for education whether for research education you, are, you have in your state people who are on the appropriation committee or head of the appropriation committee. Or you could say this is also endogenous and we need a kind of three stage where we say no, you can in, in fact, uh, it can be because in fact you become senior because there is, there was, you were the most senior in the party or region and they, they tried to do party region balance and someone else died. So the death the death of the current of the previous head is exogenous to the growth process in your state. You see what I mean? So you become head because someone else died, essentially. Or, uh, and, or, and, and then you, 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 you feel. And so what we do is to look at the process by which you become member, you, you know, making it, instrumenting it by the fact that there is vacancies you know, created on these chairs. Okay, so that's, the, that's when it's a kind of, in fact, three stages this way, not two stages this way. But here you can really strong. So the first equation is expenditure as a function of whether or not you have a, 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 vacant, a most senior in, in the region and party corresponding, vacancy also cre creating, and, uh, and with state cohort dummies. Okay, so that's my first stage. These, those are the, de the exogenous determinants of increasing expenditure on research university. And the second stage, I look at patenting. So I look at patenting uh, uh, um, in a given state when a given cohort is uh, between age, at the age where they are grossly uh, generating, where they are between 26 and 35, and where they can really patent, as a function of the expenditure on research universities, uh, expenditure on for your college, expenditure on to your college in the state, and interaction of those with uh, autonomy variables and competition for grants variables. You see, that's what I'm interaction that I'm interested in, you see? And I control for state fixed effect, core fixed effect, Time, region, fixed effect. Okay, so that, there you know uh, you have. But now you have a well-instrumented regression of growth on education. Okay, where you have both spending and and uh, governance. Okay. So uh, let me just move on here. One second. I, I will. I, you know, I'm getting there. Believe it or not. Uh, believe it or not. Uh, so my measures of autonomy. So here is the first stage. You see that you know it works very very well. Whether or not you have a most senior in the in the census region party uh, has big effect on wh on whether you will have increase in research type education. I could have put the one which is just on the right hand side. Whether or not you you have someone from your state becoming head, but we wanted to do the, the more uh, exogenous still, and it works very well as instrument. And then you say, well, now I will do the second stage. Or now remember that I have. Alors, for the U.S., we consider two measures of autonomy. One is whether you have private, you mostly private or public university in the state. So, you know, private universities are typically more autonomous than public universities. And that doesn't change over the years. For example, Benjamin Franklin, I think, was a kind of private university guy and created, I don't know if it's Virginia or Pennsylvania, because there is between Benjamin Franklin and, and Thomas Jefferson, so I don't know which one created which. Uh, but uh, Benjamin Franklin is a private guy and Jefferson is a public uh, university guy. And those characteristics don't change much over time. So the autonomy characteristic don't change much over time in the US. Those are pretty much slow moving institutions, you see? That's what's interesting. I interact those slow moving with faster moving things like spending or competition for grants, which is a faster moving uh, change. Uh, uh, so the first measure is percentage of universities in a state which are private. And uh, uh, the second one is, the, uh, is my index of uh, autonomy within state uni uh, public universities, which is uh, calculated from factor analysis, from budget independence vis-à-vis -vis the state freedom, from centralized purchasing, freedom to higher fire state wages. So I have these two index, and now I, I do, uh, I show you two tables and I'm done, believe it or not. Uh, uh, so here, I don't know if you can read, but uh, so here you have as a function of expenditure on research university core. This is the autonomous effect, but what's interesting is these effects. So what you find is the following. So the interesting findings, let me just, uh, okay, here we are. 
table one. So first you have this one. So here you see that there is a positive significant interaction between spending and autonomy index. That's the autonomy among public universities. You see, that's a, a, there is a significantly positive effect of autonomy. And uh, uh, so that's the, the, the autonomy among public universities, but you also have the percentage of universities that are private. Uh, uh, there again, you have, uh, uh, you see, you have uh, 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 complementarity between this and expenditure. So that means that really on the growth in the state, it's important to have more expenditure on research university and autonomy at the same time. They go together. Uh, also, you can show that it's good, better to have those guys when, you have, uh, when, when the state is closer to the technological frontier. I mean, if you are Alabama, it's really two years for your colleges you should emphasize. If you are California, it's more research education that you should. It's not that you should not do in Alabama, but the more, the more into innovation you are, the more it's uh, 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 research education you should be emphasizing. Okay, so that's what you learn. So you already have a complementarity between, uh, uh, you know, the slow moving and the fast moving. So now what I do is I introduce competition for grants. So you see what's interesting is that on competition for grants, and I've been almost done, uh, this is the evolution, the total of NSF, NIH, and NASA. Okay? And you saw that there, are, there was almost nothing happening between uh, universities who are getting almost zero from these guys prior to the 1960s. And then, whoop, it moved up and then down and then you see. So you have a big peak here. So that's interesting because the, the increase in research grants in the US is very much exogenous to the evolution of income of students' families. So it's not something that came from evolution of income. It's really something that was, has some exogenous part to it. So we can reasonably think it was exogenous to what you are looking at. So now what I'm doing is that I'm looking at the same as before, but now I introduce a third interactor. I have autonomy, spending, and I interact with a share of budget from competitive research grants in billions in the state, you see? And so, so I have this here, it's the amount into, that the state receives from competitive research grants. And uh, you see that this interaction, these two are very are positive, significant, you see? Whether I look at autonomy index among public universities, or university, the share of universities in the state that are private. So we see that the here is the thing to say to Sarkozy. You need competition, you need autonomy, you need uh, to spend more, okay? And that's what you learn from this. And those don't suffer from the kind of Bill Scleno type of criticism to the previous education growth regression. So thus, now we are in the conclusion. So what have we learned? What have we learned from this? Growth in advanced country origins benefit more from more performing universities. Performance hinges on a combination between finance, autonomy, and competition for grants. Uh, Sarkozy gave some autonomy to universities, but very little finance. And uh, there is not yet competition for grants in France. A little bit with a new, we have a new NSF in France. So it's starting to appear a bit competition for grants. But he gave a very strange uh, kind of autonomy. In France, presidents are elected by the faculty. At the NSC, you have a board of faculty, if, I, if I'm correct, and a board of trustees. I think the president here is named in, by a board of trustees. In, in France, uh, uh, the, the chef of cabinet of Sarkozy who used to be a prefect police thinks that you run university like you run a police station uh, uh, and he decided that the, the in fact you should uh, so uh, that the, the president is named by the by the faculty so you could have collusion between a bad president and bad faculty I could I could have me, I'm a mediocre president I hire mediocre faculty who rename who, who re-elect me and that's very bad whereas that yeah, the LSE cannot happen Huh? So, uh, so that he hasn't understood, and the conclusion for grant, well, yeah, it's not, no. but, but uh, uh, the second, the third thing is that there is more than one model for achieving this combination. You can have the UK model, uh, uh, which is more like more tuition, a bit more less public, public universities, whereas all the Swedish model was pure public uh, universities and no tuition. But both seem to work well, at least for the top 100, uh, the top 100, but I know at least something that both of them, why do uh, Sweden also does well? Because they understood the importance of giving autonomy to universities, to give funding to universities, and to have competition for grants. They have those three ingredients in Sweden. And so those they understood, they don't implement it the same way as you do. So that's what's interesting, there are many, and there we go back to the pasta story. You see, they cook pasta differently from you, but both type of pastas you would eat, whereas the French one you would not, so uh, well, uh, we'll see, we'll see what's happening with, uh, with us. Uh, 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 so then, you know, when we say to Sarkozy, well, increase funding, increase public funding, you have see funding not finding by 1% of GDP or 0.7 or 0.8 of GDP to catch up with Scandinavian countries. 
You could have fees back also partly by loans or income or contingent repayment schemes. I know you have a debate on that here, maybe we can have that debate. Of course, we push for endowments, particularly for graduate schools, like for example, uh, Andreu did in uh, Vascolel did in uh, Spain, and that we're trying to push in France a little bit. And also we push for EU funding of graduate schools on a, on a, you know, on a competing basis. Uh, autonomy uh, set up academic boards to decide university policy, but avoid self-governance with entirely internal selection of university presidents. Uh, competition for students introduce standardized European tests, avoid, avoid endogamy, favor portable pension schemes across Europe for more mobility, uh, have more uh, role for the European Research Council, for have more role for competition for research funds, and graduate fellowship for the final students. The, 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 the last one slide I had was to say that we learned something more generally. Interplay between fast-moving and slower-moving institutions. And uh, university autonomy is a slow-moving uh, grants, competitive grants is more fast-moving thing that change. And there is more than one route for success. And I think there is now kind of thinking, you know, when you think about what kind of model of economy do I want? And uh, there are things we have to avoid. But there are several ways to get to the good outcome. And that's a theme that will come back uh, in, the, in the future, in the subsequent lectures. And I'm done. Thank you. Um, I realize that the, the time has run out, but you know, as, as, as I'm sure you agree with me, it would have been a dangerous thing to try and stop the <laughs> short questions and very precise and well and, and, and not themselves mini lectures. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, Philip, do you want to? No, okay, it's fine. Right the... Yes. Hello, my name is Inga. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. But I was just actually wondering, because in the Shanghai ranting, yeah. all, the, all the universities that we were able to see were actually the ones of the developed countries or developed economies. Though the developing countries actually usually have the higher growth. And I was wondering why did you select the developed countries and not the developing ones? Okay. Thank you. So in fact, I will have a short answer. Is that here, the, the title of the lecture is growth, it's not exactly one of the titles you saw. It's growth policy making in developed economies. So that's why I was, that because it's my focus. Uh, uh, but, it's, but to answer your questions, what, what was found is that, uh, it's true, in, the, in less developed regions or countries, you saw already from the regression that already, you want to have, uh, you know, good is you primary, secondary, good undergraduate schools. It's very important also to improve the quality of secondary education. So even, for example, Portugal, for example, is not a developing country, but the, the quality of secondary education is big problematic. And because they have a problem to forming teachers and having a well-running uh, uh, secondary school, so you need good undergraduate uh, schooling also for that purpose. Of course, you can start having graduate school, but the priority there is really to have good uh, primary, secondary, good undergraduate. Whereas if you are more in, into innovation, it's more than prime. That's come from the regressions there. So even though my focus was on the developed, but I said, said also something for what are the priorities. For example, Brazil used to have enormous amount of money on graduate school. You find graduate school in Rio, like I would never have dreamed in Paris, you see. But you have terrible primary, secondary schools. Because in fact, because of the very unfair income distribution there, you saw the rich would spend, you know, to have make sure that their children would have, a, a, you know, excellent, uh, it's not nothing bad with that, but, but uh, uh, graduate schools in, in, in Rio, instead of also emphasizing, you know, there it was going the other way too much. But that's kind of very interesting why you may deviate from the, in some developing countries, from what should be optimal, which is to emphasize primary, secondary, and all of that. Given that the uh, populations in EU and Japan are declining, why growth? Shouldn't it be more important to manage the decline? Because there's severe population uh, decline, so it's unnecessary to go for growth. Oh, because you could manage. You say we don't need to grow because we are less numerous, so we could pay for health and everything for less. Uh... It's a waste of resources. Well, population is not really good. Yeah, France is not like that. Uh, France, we don't have a decline. France, you know, we love to have children. <laughs> <laughs> I won't enter into. I won't be graphic. 
Yeah, but uh, in France we don't. Iraq, they think that people don't see immigration But still, I mean, uh, so I don't know, for, for, it was, for, when we did the SAPIR record, we saw that, you know, the cost of, for example, health has increased a lot. So even if you wanted to sustain, you know, uh, health spending, and now health spending becomes more and more costly, if you want to be able to sustain that, and also you have an older population. So uh, growth was kind of very key to that. You could say, well, you could solve all the problems through immigration, you say, and through just increasing the flow, uh, but we, you know, uh, in France, for example, part of we try to say, of course, people don't work enough. So in France, we have two problems. We don't have enough productivity, but you don't have also people don't work enough. That's been well known about France. Now, Sarkozy took a solution to the problem, which is very narrow, which is to say, let's try to go back on the 35-hour thing that was done by the socialists. But I think it's a very narrow way, because deep down, you see the skills he tried are not really used. And why not? Because people are not happy at work in France. People work less in France because people are unhappy at the workplace. So in France, you could increase the amount of work by trying to improve the climate in third. So that's one dimension you can, you can play. And the rest is to improve productivity. Because people want to have higher wage. People who work in France want to earn more. But how can you pay people more if you don't make them become more productive? So you see that the, you, you, you are, in a sense, you, know, you have the emerging markets, they're catching up with you. How do you do? Can you just align yourself on the standards of living in China? No, French people will never accept that. The only way out is to say, look, you, shall, you have to become more productive. And, uh, uh, and so you play on that margin, but you also play on the margin. We also try to make it in such a way that you are also happier on the workplace. Uh, and that's the margin we are playing, you see. And, and, uh, but you have to look at the cost of health, how fast it's growing, and how much, you know, harder it's to finance it because you have a, a population getting older by the day. And, and, and that's what growth helps you solve, actually. And there has been work on the way. I don't want to go too much too long. We, we can keep the discussion. So one yeah. final question. <coughs> yeah. Do you consider the efficacy? Do you consider the efficacy of higher education more important than the proportion of people attending it? Oh, no, okay. So you look, uh, you are, no. In fact, here I looked at spending measures, but we look also at attainment measures. And of course, it's important to have attainment. So the variables, whenever you put expenditure, you could replace the uh, expenditure variable by attainment variable, which means who attends the school, or by diploma from school, you know, at the degrees. And those two, uh, those three work very much the same way. You're absolutely right. What matters is that people not only <coughs> attend, but also get somewhere from it. The quality matters. So, of course, the, the notion of quality is important. Make sure that you get somewhere. But the quality here we measure by the contribution to growth or by the Shanghai. You see what I mean? That's what tells us about quality here and what are the ingredients to good quality. Okay, thank you. Now, the, I would like, I, I, there's obviously access to mine for Philippe's time and, and answers. So, I would like to suggest that we, as a group now, invite everyone to the drinks reception on the fifth floor of the door building. So we may now only thank the for wonderful lecture.